We were just getting rejected um, I, pretty much by everyone. There's one, one studio that was like may, maybe interested, but they said we couldn't direct and that was important. Well, that it was actually rough. really more painful than that. It was like, we really want to do this. We love this. Can we see your movie? to see if we want you to direct or not. We sent them the movie and they said, yeah, you can't direct. And it was just like, it was so, <laughs> it, was so <laughs> it felt dumb. like such a terror. I was like, I've never felt so low in my life. Cause it was like, oh wow. But it, it was a hard decision. Cause it was like, we could give them strange. There's a big company. I don't want to name them. They knew who they are. They know who they are. <laughs> Do we give it to them yeah. and just back off as directors? But it was like, for us, the whole thing was we wanted to direct. That was our goal, was to direct. So we walked away from that. And that was hard because we get we didn't really have any other, no one else wanted it. So you had made one movie before Stranger Things and had written on Wayward Pines. Um, where did the idea for Stranger Things come from and did you take it out to multiple places and Netflix was just the one that got it? The answer to the first part of your question, it was interesting. It was, it was from, I think we were trying to come up with movie ideas. And amongst these, there was about 10 ideas. We were just spitballing and we wrote them all down on a Google Doc. And one of those was about the Montauk Project, which is a conspiracy theory. We love conspiracy theories. And so <laughs> that's, that's one that we felt ha we, ha we had it seen on screen and that involved children with special powers and potentially a monster and alternate dimensions. It just had a lot of stuff that we liked. But this was at a time when, you know, paranormal activity was yeah. really big and it was a found footage idea. Um, but honestly, we don't really love found footage movies, so we just sort of discarded it. We never could crack it. And then four years later or three years later, um, the movie, Denis Villeneuve's movie Prisoners, we were coming out of that and we loved it and we loved the world and we loved the characters. We go, what if we do something, a, a long form kidnapping story? And then the, the children in us go, well, is there something supernatural we can do with that? And that's really was the genesis. And if you look at that, even that single day of brainstorming that morning post Prisoners, a big chunk of the big ideas that sort of form this show are, are present there. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was weird though, because we're, we're mostly like movie people, but the m first movie we made was at Warner Brothers and it did not go well in terms of, I mean, we had a good experience making it, but hardly anyone has ever seen it. So it was like, it went from this like dream experience of like, oh my God, we made it in Hollywood, look ma. And then it was like, and then it felt like back to square one. And then every place we pitched was just asking about television. We weren't big television watchers. The concern, of course, was we didn't have any television experience. And it was, I, I was, it was really weird. It was like one week or two weeks after we had that idea, the idea for Stranger Things that we got contacted by Fox and M. Night Shyamalan um, to potentially work on Wayward Pines. So we were like, okay, we'll take this, we'll learn, soak in all we can about television, learn how television works, make it look on a resume like we know how television works. <laughs> right. basically, basically is what it was. And then so when we go out with this, people will trust us. But they didn't really, so it was like... Um, well, we honestly didn't even take it to networks because we were so inexperienced. So the thought was, let's get a studio on board. But then one of our agents happened to have lunch with someone who had started at Netflix only a week prior, as an executive who's still with us today. Matt Thanel. Matt Thanel, and he goes, we're looking for something, you know, that has younger protagonists, a supernatural edge to it, but isn't, doesn't play too young. And our agent goes, well, I might have something that, that fits that bill. So, I mean, it's always, I always tell people when they're going out with specs and stuff that there is always an element there's an element of timing and in, in, in luck involved. You guys are 90s kids, basically. Yeah, yeah. What was it about setting the story in the 80s that appealed to you? So we grew up going to see 90s movies in theaters, but we grew up on a pretty healthy diet of 80s movies, which didn't feel like, they, you know, they felt very current to us. So we were VHS kids, we were blockbuster kids. And so we just watched a lot of these movies and the Amblin style of storytelling, which is a style of storytelling that like with rare exceptions, like Super 8 had kind of gone out of style or out of fashion there, you know, and that it was a type of story telling that we really loved and wanted to see more of. We like the idea of we can make a show that feels like these movies we love. And what does that look like in a long form? So that got us really excited. When season one dropped, it was immediately massive. Um, what was your experience of that? What was that like? It was very surreal for us just because we had had such a polar opposite 
reaction <laughs> with our movie, but we always say that we're really grateful for that because I think that it gi does give you perspective and it does make, if this had been really the first thing that we had put out into the world and it just, um, and it had that kind of su success, uh, I don't know. I don't know if we would have appreciated it the way we did. And we have people continue to call us and go, just so you know, this isn't, this isn't normal. Like this is not a, a response that is normal for a project. And so, I mean, it was just honestly, the whole thing was surreal. But then because we were in the writer's room, there was this, this, this dread of, oh God, how do we, you know, can we replicate it? And subsequent seasons have just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. How's that, how's that been like as a trajectory for you guys personally and, and as artists? When we look at the sequels that we loved growing up, would someone, you know, the king of sequels would be, you know, James Cameron. What I like about what he does with his sequels is he does up the ante and he does try different things. And so that was something that was important to us. Like season one, it, it really does feel like a standalone thing. Like it, it could end, end there. Perfect. So if we're gonna do another one, it felt like it should be treated less, I mean, it is a continuation, but we wanted it to feel like a sequel. We wanted it to have a different flavor to it and also have its own beginning, middle and end. And we've been trying to do that every every year so yeah expand you know scale up a little bit and then also explore different tones how aware are you guys of um viewer feedback is that something you delve into do you avoid it what is are you both of you on the same page do you do different things i mean we can't you can't fully you can't fully avoid it obviously yeah. um and yeah, again it's been i mean we're dealing with it now with season four i mean it's really it is fun to, to see the reactions and to get the response. But again, what we try to do every season then is, is block out the noise and just tell the story, best story we can. Because, you know, at the end of the day, this is gonna be almost, you know, a decade of our lives and our actors' lives. Yeah. And so we wanna make sure that we continue to challenge ourselves. When we were starting out and struggling, so much of it was because we were chasing the trends like Ross was saying with the found footage. We were trying, we were reading Deadline, or I guess it was like, you know, Nikki Fink at the time, and it was like trying to figure out what did the industry want, what did people want, what was hot right now, and that just led to bad scripts. <laughs> and it wasn't until, like, the big epiphany we had, which just seemed so obvious, and so I always tell other people who are trying to write, it was like, stop, you know, stop writing to what you think people want and write what feels correct to you, what excites you. And so we try, it's hard, it gets, it gets noisier every year, so it's hard to ignore, but I try to, even it's different in terms of this is fan feedback as opposed to what the industry is looking for, but it's similar in the sense that I think it is actually bad um, for your writing if you start listening to that and writing to that. I think you're gonna write something that's inauthentic. I was gonna ask you about how you feel your style has evolved from season one? Like what, what would you say is your signature style? Well, yeah. it definitely continue, it, we try to continue to evolve and in every season, it's also for Matt and I, it's a bit of a sandbox to continue to learn and, and, and to, to push ourselves. So for this season we go, let's actually try to do something that is frightening. And so that led us to look back at the movies when we were, you know, falling in love with horror movies and go, which are the ones that really didn't just scare us in the moment, like a jump scare, but actually stuck with us and we couldn't, that sort of warmed its, their way into your brain. And so that brings up the Hellraisers yeah. and the Nightmare on Elm Street. And so that's really what we wanted to, to do this season. And you cast Robert Englund. <laughs> yeah, which is why, what, but that, was it, I wish it was our casting idea no, no. Or, or even our casting right. He just submitted a tape. <gasps> Which is the crazy thing about it, like, like, it, and because uh, it was, it's, it was a kind of a camp. I would never have thought right. to go to him. It was, you know, it was a one episode. One. Uh, it was a huge, hugely important role. Yeah. But we were just, you know, Carmen Cuba. She's a brilliant casting director, and she sent us all these tapes. She doesn't warn us, you know what I mean? She doesn't tell us. She just likes to put them in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And then we're watching all these auditions for Victor, and then just right in the middle, there's Robert England like lying in the middle of the bathtub delivering this monologue. And we're just, and it was weird because at that point, you know, it was very clear this season we had written most of it or a lot of it, and it was so inspired by obviously the Nightmare films. And Vecna, our new villain, was clearly inspired by um, Freddy. And and I mean, there's no way that Robert would have known that. Mm -hmm. So it just felt 
you know, as much like fade as she can get. I wanted to ask you about casting in general. In terms of looking for your young cast, what were you looking for? You just want them to feel and sound like authentic kids, real kids. That was it. It was just, does this ring true or, or not? I mean, the movies that we grew up, even like the, I remember, I still remember, I'll never forget seeing Goonies for the first time. It just was wild. We were the age of the kids when we saw it. We were watching it with our friend and it just felt like we were on screen. And so they're, they're talking over each other. I, I'm assuming, I, I think there was a lot of improvis improvisation. I mean, apparently the, the editing, well, like Walter Murch hated editing that movie because of it, but it added this, it's chaotic and it feels so real. And, but then you put them in the middle of an extraordinary adventure. So that was what we were looking for. Like, I just want it to sound like we, us and our friends sounded. And you're just waiting till you hear that. And then it becomes pretty clear. Sure, I mean, Every once in a while we've had it down down to like two, there are like two viable options, then you bring it in and it become, bring them in. But most of the time but it's only been, for us at least. It's usually just, bam. That's like, it. You know, it's like yeah. Gaten as Dustin, it was just like done, <laughs> Finn. Done. I still remember texting Carmen, it's like, Finn Wolfhard, she's like, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like, <laughs> done. it was done. As they've matured as people and as actors, can you talk about how you maybe have tailored um, storytelling to what their strengths are? I mean, that's a, the one thing I do love about television and like the one thing that makes me hesitant to veer away from television is I like that, exactly what you're describing, that you can see what they're doing, you can watch them, in this instance, like grow as people and artists and then you can write to their strengths. Every um, year we learn, again, we learn something new. I mean, season one, you know, after that we go, well, David Harbour is incredible and Millie is incredible. And so part of season two is, well, let's put them together. So there is something, again, while we, we do think ahead about what the next season is, every time we film, we go, oh, I've learned something new. Gaten and Joe together are great. We can't separate them for three. So we are, we're learning something, you know, every year. Or like Matt was saying, we did talk, we have talked about season five and broken some of it, but filming it, we've learned stuff, and I'm sure that's gonna inform where we move forward with uh, Five. The main cast is huge. Yes. And as Millie Bobby Brown has <laughs> jokingly said, yeah. sort of jokingly, <laughs> you guys need to start killing people off. Right. There was such a huge reaction in season one to Barb dying. <laughs> right. Was that something that you got nervous about killing characters? Well, the Barb phenomenon was, no, we did not, I did not expect that. But no, it, it's not, it's, it's less that and more when you t talk about a character dying, you have to look at what are the ripple effects going to be and do we like those ripple effects? Are they interesting? But as we're moving into endgame um, territory with five being the last, it's a lot more is on the table than has been in the past. I'm assuming the body, there will be a body count at yeah, the, by the a, end yeah, of this season. For sure, for sure. What are the most valuable lessons you've learned since making the first season of the show? Well, I remember even though the one thing that made me feel better was, or well, better or worse, depending, is we worked with Andrew Stannon on season two. He directed two of our episodes. And so, you know, we're big Pixar nerds. So mm -hmm. Andrew's written on some of the, in my opinion, the greatest scripts of the past you know, 30 years. And I mean, Toy Story is an airtight, beautiful script. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm pinging him about, I'm like, Andrew, how, you guys have it figured out, right? There's a, you know how, you know how to do this. And, and what Andrew said was, you, every time you think you have it figured out and then every time, every story, it's a, a completely new challenge and you have to learn all over again. Writing is so hard, but <laughs> the fact that they're struggling at Pixar makes me feel better. It's just, it's going to be a challenge every year, but you have to, I think, at the end of the day, embrace that challenge. And did you know already then these episodes are going to be much longer than anything we've done so far? We knew they were going to be longer, but not long like they ended up being. Mm -hmm. And uh, that wasn't something we, we didn't really figure that out until we were in editorial because I don't know what happened. Something changed with the way we write scripts. Well, we used if you, I, uh, we looked at it because we looked back at season one because those were scripts for, you know, 50, 55, 60 pages and the, the episodes ended up being like 48. Whereas these scripts were like 70, 75 pages and they ended up being at least 75 minutes, if not a, over. And right. so we, part of it is our writing style, I think probably just to make ourselves feel like these scripts weren't too long, we started condensing the action in terms of 
not having it spread out as much. So we squeezed it together more. So the initial thought from us and Netflix was that these episodes weren't going to be supersized episodes except for the, the last couple. Mm -hmm. And but then the edit. So it really wasn't until the edit started coming in that we went, oh, oh, God, these are these are re these are really long. But then but I was kind of relieved about it because it, it was, you know, to me, it's not about length. It's about pace. So I was just like, I, you know, Ross and I just stay stay, stay very focused on, on, on pacing and making sure that the pacing is working. And, and then the length, the fact that we could say it's supersized felt like, well, at least it's off for, you know, it sounds because we were worried about you know, fans were getting really irritated at the length, the, the length between okay. seasons. Right. And so we were able to go, yeah, it's been a long time because it's been, the episodes are really, are extra long. You're almost getting um, two seasons. It did make us feel, because we shot, like I said, for so long. And so once, once we did the math and went, oh, that it's five hours longer, then you go, oh, well, that's one reason this, this sh sh it took so long to, to film all this. What's the philosophy behind doing nine supersized episodes? I mean, it, the finale is two yeah, and a half right. hours long, as has been reported, it, rather than saying, do, doing 13. If you look at one of the episodes, like you couldn't cut out, cut it out 15 minutes early. Um, we usually have about, structurally we have, this year I think it was like four major storylines right um and and you know, they each have three or four beats per per episode so they're all building towards a, a specific point we looked at the final episode because it's so long there really wasn't a good spot to break it so it's like why at the end of the day you know if someone wants to pause it they can even to do sound and editing we had to break it into reels as if it was a movie which we've never had to do before so reel one is build up dread Real two is, you know, action chaos, and then and then real three is sort of our, our traditional uh, coda come down mm -hmm. after all of that. So um, there was you didn't really want to break it after just the build up. It wouldn't feel like a satisfying episode. So at a certain point, we just said, well, it's just a mega episode. And in terms of the expense of all of this and the length of the episodes, can you talk about is Netflix just totally on board with this? Do you have carte blanche to do whatever you want? No, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a discussion. Like we have a really great relationship with, with Netflix where, you know, everybody wants the show to um, be successful f um, for them and that. So, you know, I know it's, it's just an, it's an ongoing, it's, a, it's an, an ongoing discussion with them creatively, like what works creatively. And what, what, do, we, and what do we need really for this? What do we need for this story? Um, specifically and what is necessary and what's not and you just the goal for uh, for us though was whatever the money ends up being that the ma it, it goes on screen right. so that's actually in terms of even though it was a long shoot every one of those days was jam-packed in terms of we're moving really fast I, I know you're just embarking on season yeah. five but do you envision this kind of more episodes than you've done in the past, um, supersized episodes, do you have, do you know? Well. And do you know whether um, you'll be breaking it up? Yeah, uh, it's a good question, yeah. So, um, I mean, honestly, the split came as a result of the delay in the season, it was so long. Um, we don't have all the season, we didn't have, we wanted the season out at least by May. It felt like longer than that was really pushing, pushing it in terms of um, the, how long it had been since season three. And eight and nine are not done. So we're still working on eight and yeah. nine. That, that, so that, that is why there was a split. But we'll see, I mean, it's kind of fun. Like I kind of like it as in, it, like, it, you know, it's kind of been this forced experiment just because of the result of the pandemic. But I kind of, I'm excited that we still have basically what's a ma massive movie to drop mm -hmm. in July. Like I'm actually excited. So we'll see how it goes and whether we do that again, but a lot of it's gonna be dictated by the, the story. What are the resources you have to support you guys as writers to handle this sprawling world that you've created? I mean, we have ama amazing people. I mean, we built up, a, you know, some, a, lot of this, a lot of the people um, are still here who we hired in, in season one. So it's oddly feels sort of very like intimate and like a family. You know, it's a huge production. I think at a certain point this year, we had 2,000 people Whoa. working on the show. Oh my God. It's insane. I'm gonna ask you some questions about season four. Sure. Um, 
just so I have a clear understanding, is there a hierarchy of villains in the Upside Down? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. is, is the Mind Flayer still out there somewhere? Is Vecna less powerful than the Mind Flayer? These are all great questions, and actually Volume 2 gets at some of those questions that you're asking. The only thing that we don't fully delve into in Volume 2 is Upside Down lore. We hint at it, and I'm sure someone on Reddit will be able to maybe piece it together, mm -hmm. but a lot of those answers for the upside down or, or that is really what the basis of season five is about. I'm gonna do some rapid fire okay. questions. I'm worried about Steve. <laughs> Everyone's, worried, Everyone's about worried about Steve. How lethal do we think being bitten by a demo bat is? I wouldn't worry about the bat thing. That's more my thing. I have this thing, I'm worried about bats. So anyway, that was just me. I was just have, fixating on bats at the moment. I wrote that. So he might die some other way. If he's gonna die, it's not gonna be from the bat okay. bite. So Max proved that listening to your favorite song is holds off Vecna. Um, do each of you have a song uh, that would save you from Vecna if that were to happen? That's a really good question. I mean, I don't know. My, I would probably go back to when I was really getting into music. It was college, so it was probably, and that's like Arcade Fire's debut album, or maybe like Wake Up From Them, something like that. I need something that brings a little bit of nostalgia. Like Ross and I actually grew up mostly listening to yeah. movie music. And like, I was like really obsessed with Danny Elfman. So like his early stuff has a lot of nostalgic power for me. So maybe the like Danny Elfman Batman theme would bring <laughs> oh my me God, back to life. Wow. Yeah. Nancy does not have a Walkman. How worried should we be about Nancy? Uh, well, and also, I don't know if this is too spoiler, but I will say that they're, they're also where they are is in Eddie's trailer. And as you can imagine, Eddie and Nancy's music taste might not quite align. Oh my so. God, that's <laughs> terrifying. Um, will we find out what Will's painting is of in volume two? Yes. Okay, yes. um, and will it be something having to do with his love of Mike? We will see. I don't. I'm not gonna say what the painting is. I don't want to say. I want to watch. You we did watch, work. We did. It. We did do many, many versions of that painting. I hope people like what it ultimately. I is. like the painting because there's been a lot of build up to it. So there are many, many drafts of that painting. Yes. So we'll see what people think. Yes. You've said that Will's sexuality will be. Yes. Okay. And are we going to find out how Dr. Brenner survived from season one? Oh, that? That, no. Um, but, but, you know, he was, so, you know, when, back when we wrote season one, we always thought, you know, let, you know, we liked the idea of him coming back at some point. We didn't know exactly at what point. So his death was always off screen. But, I mean, he was just knocked down by Dem De 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 Demogorgon. There were, like, oh, soldiers yeah. all around. So that's, I'm, I'm explaining it now. Soldiers. We did. There were debates <laughs> the about Demogorgon. how. Or shot the Demogorgon. How, there were debates about how scarred he should be. How scarred and he should we be. We joked yeah. with Modine about, you know, Gary Oldman in, in Hannibal. Like, oh my God. that could be, that would be the extreme version yeah. of it. Obviously, we didn't go that. Yeah, we yeah. So, so the, 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 the first concept arts we sent Modine of, like, his level of scarring, he was not super into. <laughs> um, so, anyway, we landed up with a pretty subtle scar. So he came away pretty unscathed, remarkably unscathed. Remarkably I will, I will, unscathed. I will say. We found out in volume one that Eleven had accidentally created the Upside Down. Yeah. Um, how significant is it that it's been frozen in time um, from the day that Will got taken. Very significant. There was debate whether we even included that because we don't actually resolve that this season, mm. but it plays that moment where they realize it's frozen time really is a huge part of season five. And so we wanted to just put it out there and, and get people talking about it and thinking about it. You told my colleague Jenny Moss that um, you might George Lucas uh, oh, the God. March 22nd right. Birthday. I think we are. You are. I think we're gonna George Lucas. Up. I mean, otherwise it's too sad, guys. It's, it's too, too sad. No, it does, and it doesn't make it doesn't make any narrative sense. So like, um, we'll, we'll 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 we were talking about it yesterday. I think we're gonna we're gonna George. I'm just glad up. we've turned George Lucas into a verb. I I, same. <laughs> I've always been like, don't George Lucas things, but now I'm kind of. We have George Lucas things also that people don't know about. <gasps> That's right. But it's, it'd be hard for anyone to figure it out because you'd have to... You do have um, the physical copies, though, the blue, the Blu-rays and stuff. You'd have to compare. But, but I think the beauty of Netflix is that we can just drop... I mean, and also, even if you watch season... Maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but if you watch season four, the, the night it came out, versus if you watched it one day later, Friday. Friday, it's different, and so I think what? that we well, some of the visual, some visual of the visual facts. facts. Yeah, it's yeah. not like okay. story, but we're we're 
you're essentially patching in shots. Yeah. Netflix has, I don't think they've ever allowed people to patch on opening week, opening weekend. And, and we said, well, why not? And they said, well, it makes us nervous. And we're like, well, maybe we try it this time. And it turned out, it turned out fine. But well, I do like yeah. that we can just God, sneak but the stuff fans in. Are, the fans are unbelievable. Like we knew like there was a, uh, um, that Will said the phone number, it was the wrong number. Um, not Noah's fault. That was our fault. Yeah. We had written the wrong number into the script, and we were already ADRing and plant and patching it. And uh, but fans, God, they're so fast. Well, no, we did patch it in oh, we time, patch but it. we had oh, the, the subtitles, subtitles weren't patched, and they go, "Why are the subtitles different?" I was like, "We're working on it," and so that got patched. So I think it's exciting that we're able to just go in and like, and we also had one super fan who, <laughs> who did send us was very kind and sent it through someone at Netflix, a list of every single birthday and every mention. So now we have a dot, we have multi, we have a, we have multiple documents they sent us of every important date. So we'll never make this mistake Amazing. again. Amazing. So it wasn't in a like, hey, you know, screw you. Here's all the birthdays you don't mess up. It was like a very generous, like, I'm helping. Well, like, we said I'm we didn't fan. have we didn't have a person keeping track of this yeah. stuff, and so they were very generous. We wrote to his do this. birthday six years ago. I just right. don't I don't remember, and I don't sit down and rewatch my seasons. <laughs> like right. I don't know last time I saw season two. Anyway, I'm glad. Thank you for the fans for catching us. Don't be mad at us, <laughs> and uh, we're fixing it. What's a TV show from any time in TV history that you wish you'd created? Oh my God. Oh a lot. Oh, from any time in TV history, The Sopranos to me changed everything. I think that was the that's the one. Um, if, 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 when people, you know, 50 years from now or whatever, studying television, they're going to look at Sopranos. The Wire was a big one for me and Ross in terms of that was the first show I binged, and it changed how I viewed um, how I viewed television. And then there were so many. And so then many Breaking Bad was another one where I think it's just there are these these sort of pivotal shows and Game of Thrones also in terms of pushing what the medium of television can do and so whenever we're building a new se especially early on when we were do doing seasons we would keep pointing Netflix to look at what they're doing on on Game of Thrones and we have to let's up the ante. Freaks and Geeks would have been fun to have done. That's true. I, my, Freaks and Geeks, My So-Called Life and Friday Night Lights. Yeah, if we're going oh a little God. further. Yeah. Em yeah. Emotional. Yeah, um, is, yeah. What's something you still want to do as creators? You know, we just want to do different, you know, different stuff. I like the idea, the luxury of time that a movie affords. I don't even know what you do with all that time. But we also like the idea it, of playing with form. As we're nearing the end, we're starting to discuss what's next. It's interesting to us being at Netflix that we can play around. It's to us, it's fun to continue to experiment with it because the the 50 minute thing or the half an hour thing was really built around commercials in, in the broadcast systems. What if we just, what if we continue to play with this and treat this as something a little more malleable, treat it as if we're gonna sit down and, and write a novel. And so, and that's the kind of things we keep talking about. Um, you guys are attached to the Talisman yeah. uh, as executive producers. Um, how far along is that? And you, with, what's it like working with Steven Spielberg? <laughs> Stephen mean, King, I mean. Yeah, right, no, it's amazing. So, um, well, we just, you know, we had one, you know, one meeting um, with, with Steven Spielberg and, and, and the other producers. It's really early right now. It's just we have an outline right. for, um, the first, for, for the first episode. Yeah, I think yeah. with Spielberg, it really what is so inspiring is just how much he loves the joy of storytelling and specifically with this the story of the talisman it's really there again there's a, a lot of supernatural things there's a werewolf there's a lot of exciting things that are going on but at its core it's a really about a, a mother and a son in their in their relationship and their love for one another and so i think you know hopefully the goal of it is to to make sure that that is that really carries the series right. so we're excited about it you've said you have an idea for a spinoff um, yes. That only Phil, Finn, Finn Wolfhard, Wolfhard has yes. guessed. Yes. Um, it, w it, it, would you th would you complete season five and then begin working on that? Probably. Pro there's a ver we, we there's a version of it going developing in parallel. They would okay. never shoot in parallel. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, I think actually we're going to start delving into that soon. I think as as we're winding down and waiting for in finishing these visual effects, Matt and I are going to actually start getting into it. I mean, the wow. reason we haven't done anything is just because you just don't want to be doing it for the wrong reasons. And it was just like, is this something I would want to make regardless of the, it being related to Stranger Things or not? And definitely. So even if, it, if we took the Stranger Things title off of it, 
I would, it's just, I'm so, so excited about, but it is not what, I don't think anyone's going to be thinking, you know, it's going to be different than what anyone's expecting, including Netflix. Except when Finn oh. Wolfhard. Except Finn, Finn Wolfhard is, but he's. He I, wasn't like spitballing, is it this, is it this? He just goes, I think this will be a cool spinoff. We're like, how, how in the world? He's going to, I really, I do predict that Finn's going to be, um, he's, I well, think he's, he's going to, he's, he's his, already directing his first feature coming up. And I think he's going to be. And I've seen his short film's really good. I think the kid's going to be, I think he's going to be a director. I think he's going to be a really talented director is what I think. That's my prediction.